it's really been very interesting for me being here as a neurosurgeon uh, because it takes me back to the reason that I went into neuroscience 30 years ago, and that was to try to understand consciousness. Then I realized I wasn't smart enough to really understand consciousness, so I began to focus on other things. And it's been great sort of listening to all the concepts here. Uh, for most of my academic career, I focused on trying to develop effective treatments for brain cancer. I used to always say that there could be nothing more devastating than a diagnosis of brain cancer. It takes away the very essence of who we are, our thoughts, our memories, our ability for language to interact with our family and loved ones. Uh, until I uh, had uh, a very close family member, my mother developed Alzheimer's disease. And I realized at that point that that could be nothing more devastating than Alzheimer's disease because it also takes away the very essence of who we are. But unlike brain cancer, where the bad time is only about three months, in Alzheimer's, that can last a very long time. So I began to try to understand the challenges that we face in Alzheimer's. And a number of things really became very apparent to me. And the first thing uh, is that we're really entering into a very different period uh, in healthcare uh, and uh, in basically uh, the way that we live uh, as a species. If you just take the change in population growth just in the United States and you begin to look at, for example, what happened in the change uh, between 1950 and 1960, you see that the greatest change really occurred in people under 15. Between 1960 and 1970, it was really sort of in the 15 to 24 year old. And then it moved up in the 70s to 80s, uh, 80s to 90s. And you begin to sort of see this trend of what's basically occurring here. So that currently, the greatest change in the population is in people less greater than 55 years old. And that's great. So we're living longer, and that's a good thing. Also, we begin to understand that our life expectancy is increasing, and is actually increasing dramatically. Uh, you know, in, in my parents' lifetime, you know, if someone lived into their 60s, 60, early 60s, that was great. We expect to live certainly into our, you know, early uh, uh, 90s, hopefully. Uh, and it's beginning to increase, and, and we all understand that. But if you plot this trend, really over the last 100,000 years of human existence, this is the curve that you see. We're really undergoing an explosion in our ability to live longer. Now that's great, but the problem with that is that our bodies are really designed to outlive our brains. And so what happens is that as we learn how to keep our bodies healthier for a longer period of time, we haven't kept up with how to keep our brains healthy. So as we age, we're beginning in healthcare to see a very different phenomenon. So what people worry about as they age now is not having a heart attack, it's not having a stroke, it's not dying of cancer. What we worry about now is Alzheimer's disease. So if you survey people later in life what they are most concerned about in terms of a disabling disease, 61% will say what they worry about is really Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, we hear about someone getting Alzheimer's or a relative developing Alzheimer's. Uh, we never heard about it that much when we were children. Our parents definitely didn't hear about it that much when they were children because most people didn't live as long as we live now. But when you begin to understand the statistics that one in eight people that are 65 and older will have Alzheimer's disease, you begin to understand the implications of this diagnosis and this disease. And in fact, 47% of individuals 85 and older will have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Now that's unsustainable because we know that we're living much longer. And what we're beginning to see in healthcare, you know, forget about, you know, uh, the Affordable Health Care Act and trying to basically afford health care 
if we continue this trend, what we essentially are seeing is something like Hurricane Katrina coming to us and us not reacting about it. But in reality, it's not really a Hurricane Katrina. So I tried to, to actually make this graphic more realistic to what we're actually facing. And Hurricane Katrina doesn't look like Hurricane Katrina. It really looks like this. This is what we're essentially facing. So we've made a lot of progress in being able to treat a lot of different pathology. If you look at our ability to treat breast cancer, the, the change in deaths of breast cancer is, is decreasing, and prostate cancer is decreasing, heart disease is decreasing, stroke, HIV, we've made a lot of progress. But the number of deaths from Alzheimer's disease is climbing dramatically. Uh, the cost currently in the United States alone to treat Alzheimer's disease is $200 billion a year for one disease. Now, that is going to increase dramatically so that by 2050, the cost of treating Alzheimer's disease just in the United States will be $20 trillion unless we find a solution. So it doesn't take an economist to understand that with that cost, we will essentially bankrupt not only the healthcare system, but our entire economy and the economies of the Western uh, world. So a baby that's born today doesn't have a life expectancy of 78. A baby that's born today has a one out of three chance of living to 100. So this increase in life expectancy is growing, and it's growing dramatically. So what we really need to do is to develop sort of a new concept of what it's like to age and what it's like to keep our bodies healthy as we age. So this is an 87-year-old, right, doing gymnastics. And I think that as we talk about wellness and as we're here at the uh, Deepra Chopra conference about wellness, this is really what the face of aging should look like uh, for us as we move forward. Now, in terms of our brain health, unfortunately, we begin to have cognitive decline at about age 30. So I'm really happy to hear all of the great discoveries that the previous speaker was working on now. <laughs> because for most of us, you know, that margin of cognitive brain function is already beginning to decline. So what happens as we age is that we begin to build up toxic waste products, uh, unfolded proteins that are toxic to our brain cells that begin to damage and kill our brain cells. The hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is really sort of two pathological phenomena. One is the buildup of, of these toxic proteins forming plaques that are called amyloid plaques. And the second is neurofibrillary tangles, uh, which you heard about in, in one of the earlier talks. But the interesting thing, right, is that these plaques have a continual buildup as we age. So if we look at the uh, rate of plaques in our brain as we age, they don't level off. They just continue to go up. And about 15 years after the buildup of these plaques, we begin to develop Alzheimer's disease. So these plaques basically build up about 15 years before, and they're toxic. So despite spending billions of dollars in our healthcare system to try to find a solution to Alzheimer's disease, most of the pharmaceutical trials have failed because we're treating patients when they've developed symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. We're treating patients about 15, 30 years into the disease when they've already had a significant amount of brain cell loss, and we're trying to essentially treat them at the end stage of the disease rather than at the beginning of the disease. So essentially, by the time that we currently diagnose Alzheimer's disease, when someone has memory loss, cognitive decline, they've already lost 47% of their brain cells, half of their brain weight, 
and have already had the disease for about 20 to 25 years with the buildup of these toxic plaques. And if we're going to be successful, and I think in the spirit of what DPROC has tried to, to basically teach over the years, we have to prevent rather than try to react. So we need to prevent the loss of these brain cells rather than to try to regenerate these brain cells once they occur. So the buildup of this amyloid in the brain really begins to occur as the first phenomenon about 20 years before we develop what's called MCI, a mild cognitive impairment. Uh, and then, you know, about four or five years after that, we actually developed overt dementia. So if you could detect these plaques very early, you could have the earliest hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Later, you get the formation of synaptic dysfunction and then the accumulation of these tangles uh, and cognitive decline uh, and then loss of clinical function. So I was very intrigued uh, by the um, imagery that you chose for the conference. You showed an eye becoming the universe. And uh, we believe, or one of the things that I would basically submit is that the eye is really a window to the brain. People say the eye is a window to the soul, but for us, the eye is a window to the brain. And when we look through the eye as physicians, in the back of the eye, we're looking at brain tissue. The retina is really brain tissue. So as a neurosurgeon, I can put a hole in the skull and do a biopsy and look at brain tissue, or I can non-invasively look at the eye. So we asked whether or not we could detect these abnormal proteins uh, that cause Alzheimer's disease at a very early stage. And, uh, uh, in the brain and whether we could detect those in the eye. And what we've done uh, is that we've actually developed a test that you can get at your uh, uh, eye doctor when you go for your eye exam uh, with a regular sort of retinal imaging scanner. And when they look in the back of the retina uh, with this test, you can detect these accumulation of these abnormal uh, plaques that are really the hallmark of, of Alzheimer's disease. So you can see these little plaques occurring and what we've developed is what's called a retinal amyloid index, uh, which actually correlates with amyloid PET scan, which is never going to be used as a screening technology. But it can essentially be a 20-minute test that can be performed as a routine part of the eye exam uh, in people that may be over 50. If you have APOE4, you have genetic risk. That may be earlier, more frequent. I like the concept of individualized health care in which to really focus this and, and, and to do. So um, I think that as we live longer, as we live better, we need to not only teach our bodies how to uh, live better, but we need to learn how to keep our brains healthier. We need to detect the changes that occur in our brains with aging. We need to do that non-invasively. And one of the, the questions that we always get uh, when they say, oh, you know, we have a test that can tell you if you're going to get Alzheimer's 20 years beforehand, you know, what can you do about it? I mean, I don't really want to know if I'm going to develop Alzheimer's if I don't have anything to do about it. You know, just let me be. So I submit that if you know that you're developing Alzheimer's disease, you have the ability to try to intervene early, and your chances of intervening are much more likely. You can begin to enroll in clinical trials that are now looking to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Or you can begin to have lifestyle changes where we're developing a body of evidence that these lifestyle changes may be able to influence the accumulation of these toxic proteins and may be able to slow down uh, the detrimental effects that are occurring in the brain, things like yoga, things like meditation. Exercise uh, is beginning to show that it's able to slow down the accumulation, the Mediterranean diet, using grass types of therapies, uh, supplements, nutraceuticals, uh, is beginning to show evidence. And if I get invited back next year to this conference, uh, we'll talk about some of the things that we're doing to accumulate and have scientific evidence and to begin to integrate some of these things uh, into our lifestyle that can begin uh, to make a difference uh, in this. So, you know, as a neurosurgeon who's really spent most of my career trying to develop a treatment for brain cancer, 
uh, I think this is something that we can solve. You know, brain cancer is hard because with brain cancer, you have to kill every single cancer cell in the body. Uh, with cognitive decline and dementia associated with aging, if this actually develops about 20 years before, and it's a slow process, so that if you're developing the disease at 50 and you're going to get memory loss at 70 or 75, the only thing that we really need to do is to slow down the slope, right? So that you don't get memory loss at 75, you get memory loss at 95, so that you can essentially avoid the symptomatic phase of the disease. And we believe that with sensitive non-invasive tests to monitor the toxic accumulation of these um, uh, detrimental proteins by looking, for example, through the eye or through the blood, being able to monitor whether you're altering the course of these toxins, uh, we have the ability to try to impact this and intervene and to achieve a lifestyle that we can look forward to. Thank you. Doc Dr. Black, one thing that you said that was astounding is that cognitive decline starts at age 30. And I think that, I don't know, for me and all the stories that I've done, the studies that I have done, you always associate cognitive decline when you're elderly, mm -hmm. but the age of 30. I, 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 yeah, so, you know, it's interesting because I enjoyed a lot of the talks from the uh, uh, quantum physicists uh, yesterday and last night. And if you ask a physicist, right, there are very few Nobel Prizes awarded in physics to any discovery that anyone made after 30. That's right. And that's because, you know, our brains, we have uh, greater cell function, more connectivity, uh, and we begin to sort of lose cognitive function at about age 30. Um, we all know that, right? So um, we, need to, we need to understand that better, and we need to learn how to intervene and alter that process better. But we have a natural sort of aging decline, and we have an accelerated decline with Alzheimer's, and we want to try to modify both. So is it then, let me ask you, as, as a mom who's raising young children, okay, uh -huh. and now being aware of this information, uh -huh. what can I be doing? How young can my kids be where I can be doing brain exercises. I mean, you mentioned supplements and exercise and yoga and, and what we eat. Is there anything more that we can do? And, and how young, how young can, can children start doing these types of things? So uh, the younger, the better. Uh, we know that there's a very dynamic process that occurs. So it's not just something that happens later in life. You know, these misfolded toxic proteins are actually occurring throughout life, but our ability to clear them, right, avoids a lot of the deleterious consequences of these proteins. But we know, for example, that um, uh, there have been some suggestion in India, for example, where people take uh, a lot of curry uh, that has curcumin in it throughout life. Right. There's a lower incidence of Alzheimer's. So we know that dietary supplements can make a difference. We know that, that lifestyle can make a difference. We know that the Mediterranean diet is associated with better cognitive function associated uh, with aging. So lifestyle can make a difference, exercise. Stress is very bad. We know that high cortisol levels is toxic to neurons. So all of these things, as we begin to accumulate scientific evidence, we want to incorporate into lifestyle, not just at 50, not just at 70, but throughout life. Just one comment, and thank you, Dr. Black, yeah. for that very enlightening talk. You're going to stay around, I hope, right? Uh, yes. Today, because right. we have more Alzheimer's right. talk coming. But uh, uh, brain exercises, there's no proof that they do anything. It's more exercise, physical exercise, meditation, yoga, and diet. Yeah. Am I right? That's, that's correct. And in fact, um, you know, Lumosity, which has been very popular, you know, beginning to sort of look at that, and people always say using the New York Times crossword puzzle, but you have to do an, um, a cognitive function that creates uh, a difficulty or challenge for you. So uh, if you are terrible at foreign languages and you're 60 years old, you have to learn a foreign language. Or if you're terrible at music, you have to learn how to play the piano. Not just doing something that's repetitive, and actually, as Deepak says, exercise is not just exercise, but exercise actually increases blood flow to the brain. It causes regeneration 
of brain cells. It does a lot of things uh, that we're just beginning to understand. Yeah, because I think there's a misconception. When yeah. I had, my mother-in-law had Alzheimer's. I remember being in this home, which was supposed to be the top of its game, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of the elderly people were doing crossword puzzles, and right. therapists were telling them, you need to exercise your brain, you need to read, you need mm -hmm. to do puzzles. So that's actually a misconception? Probably. Yeah, yeah. that's probably a misconception, doing repetitive mm -hmm. exercises. It's not doing something that you're used to doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I'm a brain surgeon, so continuing to learn how to do brain surgery isn't yeah, going to be very sense. helpful for me. But I'm terrible at foreign languages, so if I learn a foreign language, that will increase my synaptic connectivity, cause neuronal regeneration, uh, and help preserve brain function with aging. Great. One more comment, you know, um, and we're going to hear more about this, but uh, just so that everybody looks at this in context, there are only three or four genes for Rudy will talk about that and you know, I'm sure you uh, will agree that there are only three or four genes for Alzheimer's that are fully penetrant. Right. The rest are influenced by lifestyle and there are over a hundred of them. Right. Yeah. And you know, one of the genes is very common and that's the APOE4 gene. And if you have one allele of the APOE4, your risk of developing Alzheimer's is twice as high. If you have two of the alleles, your risk is really four times higher. So being able to individualize your approach and begin to intervene early uh, can have a significant impact. 